So I was most interested in what I thought should have been the central question of this COP. Could we at long last get a handle on fossil fuels? And in particular, could we get a direction from the international community through the COP28 and its final communique that it is essential to for the nations to work to rapidly phase out oil, gas, and coal? Welcome to the Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina and I'll be your host as we discuss the COP28 recap. We're very lucky today to have our special guest, Dan Galpern, with us, who is able to join us and participate in quite a few very important panels when we were there at the COP. And we also, of course, have our regular, Paul, who has a lot of thoughts on what came out of that conference. We'll also be hearing backstage from Charles. And Heidi, will we be hearing from you? Yes. Wonderful. So the whole crew is going to weigh in on their experience. I just want to let you know that everything that you see in the media, believe it or not, isn't exactly always so. So there was a lot of reportage about the COP. And I actually think a lot more this year and previous years, and correct me, the rest of the team, if I am wrong, um, but I do think that there was a lot of good uh, reporting on the COP and things that were going on and were being discussed. One thing that I have found problematic in the last few COPs is the framing of it. I noticed this particularly last year when we were in Egypt. Every time that the media spoke about COP, they would say, you know, reporting from the resort town of Sharm el Sheikh. Yes, there are. Absolutely. Historically, Sharm el Sheikh has been a resort town. And But listen, a lot of us aren't there sipping daiquiris and flying in on our private jets as they're reporting. A lot of us really saved up a lot of money so that we could attend this, so that we could participate, so that we could have our and other important voices heard. So yeah, it's not just a big cocktail party. I think that's really important to state. This year in Dubai, I read some reporting about, you know, how there were ice cream stands and delicious gourmet food and spongy sidewalks so we didn't have to walk on the hard concrete. One thing they didn't mention is there was one ice cream stand for 70,000 people, and not everyone was partaking. For me, I certainly didn't because I think the popsicles were $10. Uh, the spongy sidewalk portion, that was there when the venue was built in 2020, so it really had nothing to do with COP. So I just think it's really important to disabuse people who are watching this notion that we're like this martini class who are, are going to these conferences just to like rub shoulders with high-level delegates. It's just simply not true. We really, really care about the planet, the environment, and what's going on. And that's why we make the great effort, and it is an effort, to show up there. I think a lot came out of this particular conference. Like always, there was good and bad. And from our perspective, and certainly from mine, it's not enough. What would be enough? Let's draw down fossil fuel production. Let's draw down fossil fuel consumption. Let's amp up renewables right away. There are a lot of countries that weigh in and drag their feet on this. And it's just the way that the conference goes. And I'm going to go ahead and, and without saying any more about all of the peripherals, I, I want to hear from Paul what you gathered. You were on the ground in Canada. You didn't join us this year. So I'm interested to hear what you heard and what you think about this year's COP. Thank you, um, Regina. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of, of the COP from my perspective. So I'll talk about the pros first. Leading up to the COP and after the COP and during, it is a, a huge event in the eyes of the media, right? There's tremendous amounts of media coverage of all types. Um, and as you get closer to the COP, uh, just about every 
non-governmental organization and branch of NOAA and climate group comes out with a report um, with their deadline to release a report before or during the COP. So all of that is good to raise the visibility in the eyes of the public on climate change and how it's affecting people. And that's all good stuff. You know, some of the cons are, there's still an overemphasis on, and it's not just the COP, it's on mainstream science, on this idea of 1.5 Celsius or 1.5 alive. And if you look at the latest science from James Hansen, and mostly from James Hansen, but also from others, you know, if you look at the data this year, 2023, we're going to be very close to that 1.5 for the entire year. If you take the rolling average, one year average, in a few months, we'll be above 1.5. Um, in six months, we're likely to be pushing months that are two degrees above. We've already reached specific individual days that are two degrees above. So 1.5 is not alive. 1.5 is absolutely dead. And we're rapidly approaching two Celsius. I think um, it's important for people around the world to see and get this and understand this. And I think many, many more will over the next six months to a year when they see what's going on, uh, because we're in for massive changes in the next little while. And the metric, you know, 1.5, 2 degrees, that will probably be, be changed soon. I mean, the true metric is really the Earth energy imbalance. It's the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. As long as greenhouse gases are increasing exponentially, we're obviously not doing things right. And the Earth energy imbalance, it's almost doubled in the last 10 years. And the more it is above zero, the more warming we get and the greatly accelerated warming that occurs. The other thing, you know, logistically, the COPs become very unwieldy. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the, the, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, they really need to start thinking seriously about a different format for the COP. I like the idea of, of just moving it, having it one year in Bonn and one year in New York City in buildings that can support a maximum of about 5,000 people and have, you know, get rid of all of the fossil fuel um, lobbyists and you know, have country representatives there negotiating. The fact that there's so many fossil fuel lobbyists, the fact that the president was president of an oil company as well, the, the fact that there were all these multi bilateral deals with countries trying to say, well, what are you going to do about climate change? Oh, by the way, can you buy more of our oil from our national oil company? It just looks really, really bad. These conferences are very important. It, we need to keep having them. You know, it's a venue that gets people from around the world together focused on this problem. As I mentioned, there's lots of pros of having the conference, but I think the format needs to be changed. It, it takes time for the UN to change things. Next year's conference is in Baku, Azerbaijan, which is another fossil fuel producing country. I just hope they don't get the president of their biggest oil company to be the, the host of, of COP29. Uh, thank you so much for your thoughts, Paul, especially in regards to the oil producing nations hosting the COP and how that creates uh, not so much of a good look. And of course, having lobbyists for the fossil fuel industry is just an absolute nightmare and should not be. I want to turn it over to Dan because I know you have a lot of really interesting thoughts, Dan. Um, so please share with us your thoughts. Thank you, uh, Regina, Charles, Heidi, and Paul. Uh, good to be with you. So I was most interested in what I thought should have been the central question of this COP. Could we at long last get a handle on fossil fuels? And in particular, could we get a direction from the international community through the COP28 and its final communique that it is essential to uh, for 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 the, for the nations to work to rapidly phase out oil, gas, and coal. And indeed, I should say, early on at this COP, uh, I did have the occasion to run into a United States delegate, official delegate, to the talks. And I used the opportunity, I thought, to the maximum capacity to press him on that central question. What, in fact, is our position, is the United States position on that central question? Should we, through COP28, 
uh, adopt a, a, a position in what is the United States' role going to be towards that end that the nations need to rapidly phase out fossil fuels. A after going back and forth, by, by the way, I should say, he said, well, look, Dan, I need to tell you, we are the most progressive delegation of any fossil fuel producing nation. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting cop out, no pun intended. You can see in the chart that I've produced the evolution of this question in the so-called uh, global st uh, stock take document. And so maybe I should explain that briefly. Under the Paris Agreement uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Paris Agreement was signed in by almost all the nations in 2015. On a periodic, that is five-year basis, the nations are supposed to come together and do a, essentially a, a report card as to progress to meet the central goals of the Paris Agreement, including staying within its temperature limits and undertaking action, concerted action to combat dangerous climate change. This global stock take, the uh, unhappily but very straightforward term of art, uh, is supposed to have practical significance in, in that it is supposed to inform every round of nationally determined contributions, that is, pledges from the nations uh, that must be filed with the secretariat and, and bind those nations to the plans of action that they publicly commit to. So that if the global uh, stock take indicates that we're far off track in stabilizing atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases that are pressing our planet to towards catastrophe, well then, that should be reflected in more stringent limits and greater ambition and, and actual action through the nationally determined contributions, so-called so NDCs. So ahead of COP28, there were a number of meetings and series of reports issued, including from the United Nations Environmental Pro Program and a number of NGOs, including the Stockholm Environment Institute, indicating that, in fact, as everyone well knows, we're way off course, way behind the curve. And so perhaps because of the formal positioning of this COP as the one where we're going to have the first global stock take, a number of nations, I think 130 of them, actually in advance demanded that the global stock take in, include strong language demanding a phase out of the uh, production and utilization of fossil fuels. Uh, so I've, I've produced this so that we could uh, have a look. Uh, the version of the global stock take from December 5, in fact, did call for an orderly and just phase out of fossil fuels. And there is another lesser option asking the nations to accelerate efforts towards phasing out unabated fossil fuels. We could talk about what that means. The term, by the way, is nowhere clearly, unabated is nowhere clearly defined. I mean, what does it mean? If you're uh, emitting a ton, for example, of C CO2 emissions from fossil fuels, what would it mean that that is abated? That is 50% of it is captured and sequestered or 5% of it? No one really knows. It's a loose term of art utilized for purposes of securing agreement where none really exists. And, and in any event, by December 8, just three days later, there were a range of different uh, options aimed at securing agreement for a phase out of fossil fuels. One was a phase out of fossil fuels in line with the best available science. And option two was another iteration of that. And again, option three was a phase out of unabated fossil fuels, recognizing the need for a peak in their consumption this decade. So a peak in the consumption of unabated fossil fuels. These weasel words get comical if you dig down into it, which is probably necessary to do. In any event, still, though, uh, there was a, a, a lot reflected in the actual bargaining text. But by December 11th, the phase out of fossil fuels had disappeared from the text.
perhaps at the behest of Saudi Arabia and uh, perhaps also at the behest of China. But in any event, this caused a bit of an uproar. There was even a demonstration after this was submitted. And there were uh, a lot of very strong condemnation statements from a number of the delegations, including, for example, the Marshall Islands representative who said, we did not come here to sign our death warrant, things of that nature. And so the secretariat quickly regrouped, including Dr. Sultan al Jaber, uh, who claimed that that iteration that had been released by the secretariat had been uh, deposited for purposes of getting people to focus their minds a little bit more. In any event, the delegations worked into overtime, actually. They, they, they worked 23 hours over the uh, slated deadline and came out with what I have in the final column there on uh, December uh, 13. And this is quite weak language, but it still has something. By the way, this is the first time that the term fossil fuels has actually even appeared in a final communique from COP28. But is that a tremendous accomplishment? Not really. Depends on what they say about fossil fuels. And so the eventual consensus direction from this COP is that it calls on all parties to contribute to an, a range of global efforts in a nationally determined manner that is case by case, taking into account the various national circumstances, pathways, and approaches, including transitioning away from fossil fuels in energy systems in a just, orderly, and equitable manner, accelerating action in this critical decade so as to achieve net zero by 2050 in keeping with the science. So what kind of um, statement is this? I would say it's one that is open to interpretation and reinterpretation. I'd say it's, it's good that the need to transition away from fossil fuels is mentioned, but it certainly is no type of uh, binding imposed obligation where a nation that is not already determined to do something in this area uh, will feel compelled to do something significant uh, in this area. So I think then that much depends on its implementation. And in particular, for those nations and national groups, for example, the United States, North America generally, the European Union, China, perhaps, they could take this language and run with it and uh, on their own seek to implement it through a rapid phase out of the production as well as the utilization of fossil fuels. And with respect to, for example, the United States, this could be uh, in part a justification for ending the massive production and export of fossil fuels. Uh, if that were done, then this communication, weak as it is, could have some salient uh, results. But if not, then I think not much has been done under the global stock take in this final communication. I hope that's not too harsh, but that's what I think. Yeah, thanks, Dan, because honestly, there was too much of the, of the bright side and good news reported and not enough of what Antonio Guterres referred to as us heading headlong to the highway of hell, climate disaster, which is exactly what we're doing. We're just putting a pretty bow on it. So, Peter, what were your observations regarding COP? You know, the expectations of the COP28 being the 28th one, you know, 30 years since the uh, climate convention, I, I think probably from most climate change followers, and it was not particularly great, especially in view of the fact that Al Jabir was chosen to be president of the COP. He's head of the biggest United Arab Emirate oil and gas project. And United Arab Emirates, of course, are huge in natural gas and particularly in LNG, in the liquid fraction of natural gas to get it exported. They're a major, major player indeed. 
that was interesting, not to say the least. So he got, of course, a lot of media when he made the statement that there was no science behind a phase out of fossil fuels. Luckily, there was a response from a number of the scientists, both individually and as groups, to say that that statement uh, was not true. However, two days after this was uh, publicized and a lot of fuss about it, he met with the chair of the IPCC, Jim Skier. And it looked like Jim Skier was actually um, uh, supporting Al Jabir and what he was saying, because the statement that got published from that meeting from the IPCC chair was, well, we have to reduce carbon emissions substantially. We have to reduce for uh, oil and gas. 40% wasn't a lot to me by 2050, but they didn't mention coal, funnily enough. So the IPCC didn't respond very well to his statement, but the scientists in general certainly did. When I got to look at the document, because my background really is in environmental health policy, so I, I, I've been through the policy <laughs> loops and I know how it works and how it doesn't work. So it was very, very odd because um, it was called a, a, a stock take outcome, but there was no language in the uh, document other than what the lawyers call preamble language. And preamble language carries really no weight whatsoever. In fact, there was only one paragraph under the whole document which mentioned the word commit. And that was just a general commit to accelerating action over this crucial decade. It was basically a sustainable development statement under sustainable development, under under differentiated responsibilities and to eradicate poverty. So there was this one paragraph which was commitment at all. Everything else was just recognized. So the part of the text that got the media attention was uh, paragraph 28. And, and that was the one which we weren't happy with because it seemed to recognize carbon capture storage as a mitigation approach, which certainly it is not, because we're in a dire climate emergency, mitigation has to be done immediately. And one thing which was in the document, which was good to see, was they recognized that emissions must peak 2020 to 2025. This is direct from the IPCC AR6 for a 1.5 degree C limit, which of course is totally out of reach, but also for a two degree C limit. So that recollection was good because that's solid science. But none of this got mentioned in the media. None of the things that could be useful actually got mentioned in the media. The things that were mentioned in the media were the fact that uh, there was not a uh, phase out of fossil fuels in the end, and it looked like there was going to be but something happened in the last minute and there wasn't. The other thing which we didn't like was a reference to mitigation. It was basically bridge fuels and everybody realized that the fuel that was being recognized was natural gas. The natural gas estimates of emissions by the IPCC does not include the methane yet. So the estimates of natural gas's effect are way, way down what they really, really are because the methane that leaks is a huge amount of forcing from greenhouse gas emissions. So those two make methane almost as bad as coal with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the worst thing of all to me was there was a clause in it which made it very clear that coal was not to be phased down or stopped. So the statement on coal was the strongest one supporting coal that I can remember. I mean, that's absolutely terrible. It was, we are going to accelerate efforts. So that always means nothing, right? Efforts, we're going to try. And to phase down coal again. So the message there was that coal is going to continue. And under the energy projections, coal is going to continue. I know there are still people, they've been saying for 10 years at least, the day is over for coal, but the energy projections like the uh, IEA and the e 
EAI in the in, uh, United States, which I prefer to rely on, says that there's going to be no reduction in coal for probably 10, 20 years. So that, that, of course, obviously is the worst thing possible. And I think the media should have picked up on that because it's so, so important. Paul, did you have anything else to add in reference to what Dan just shared with us? If I'm a pack-a-day smoker and I go to my doctor and my doctor says, you have cancer, he doesn't say that I have to transition off cigarettes, right? Or if I eat a box of donuts a day and I go to my doctor and he says, you have diabetes, the doctor will not tell me to transition off, off donut, right? I mean, we have to do more than, than transition. We're in a climate emergency. Temperatures are spiking and we're, we're already past 1.5. We're going to be past two very soon the way we're going. If I could add to that, Paul, uh, just a second. You know, this whole business about net zero also is a framework that can allow almost anything. For example, it makes a huge yeah. difference. If you continue emissions at a high level until, say, 2040 or 2045, you know, it's possible to you know, get to net zero by 2050 and still have a tremendous amount of uh, CO2 emissions and other emissions, but especially CO2 on the way. And that's important because once released in, into the atmosphere, uh, a substantial portion of CO2 uh, remains essentially forever unless there's a substantial effort, very, very expensive to accelerate uh, their removal. We need uh, binding or uh, at least stringent guideposts and commitments and uh, verification and you know a competitive effort here to do what we all know is necessary, including at minimum, a rapid phase out of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, and, right. and, and by the way, you know, uh, I mean, there, there are some <laughs> positive movements at COP28 that I should hasten to add. For example, on day one at the opening plenary session, uh, the nations finally agreed to operationalize a loss and damage fund to assist nations with climate related disasters uh, including you know typhoons and very strong hurricanes or even with uh, rapid sea level rise and that was good but again it's not getting to the root of the problem it's sort of like mowing the lawn and there were there was a call in fact to uh, uh, that the nations should increase their efforts to cut back on methane emissions although the uh, particularized call for certain levels of cuts by 2030 and 2035, and not only with respect to methane, but other non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions, including nitrous oxide uh, and the uh, and the F gases. Uh, all the language about the F gases and nitrous oxide were eliminated by the final communique. And then the methane, uh, the call for additional action on methane was weakened somewhat, but still is uh, significant. So with respect to uh, certain important matters, uh, there was some progress, but I would say very, very limited progress. You have to look closely to find it with respect to the central question of the phase out of um, fossil fuels. The other thing, of course, was that we got the weasel words on uh, fossil fuel subsidies. I don't understand why people don't realize that stopping the fossil fuel subsidies is the priority, right? So no matter what you get agreed, whether it's we, we intend to phase out, right, or we intend to uh, phase down, or we intend to transition, none of it means anything at all unless the governments are committing to a way to do it, right? So the first way to do it is obviously to stop the $7 trillion in fossil fuel subsidies a year. And that doesn't seem to get pushed as hard as it deserves to get pushed. Maybe it gets lost in all the other phrases and, uh, you know, and considerations. Those subsidies, by the way, have been going up. So imagine if we took away all those subsidies, 
the market, which of course is very sensitive and very powerful, in, in my view, would immediately swing out of fossil fuels and into renewable energy. And that would make immediate difference on CO2 emissions. The IMF agrees on that. In their report uh, this year, for the first time, they modeled what would happen if the uh, subsidies were terminated. And it was a major, major difference, a huge drop in CO2 emissions and atmospheric CO2. So in other words, we have a very powerful tool to use against the fossil fuel corporations, but I, I just don't think we're using it near, near, near enough. The sort of largest presence, which I really like, which is very, very good indeed, is the combined um, NGOs got together under the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, you remember. And in that, they do have a cancellation of fossil fuel subsidies. So, so that's good. Uh, all power to them. And they got some more success in, in COP28. They got some uh, other countries signing on to the non-proliferation uh, treaty. So the question then is, is what difference is COP28 going to make? Well, it's not going to make a scrap of difference to um, our emissions, right? Our um, uh, CO2 emissions just recently estimated by the Global Carbon Project are uh, yet again a new high. They've increased again uh, 1% from last year. I look back at the rate of increase of uh, fossil fuel CO2 emissions from uh, 1960, and if you average it right out, it's about 1%. So right now, we are increasing our fossil fuel CO2 emissions at the same rate that's been going on for decades, right? So that could hardly, hardly be worse. People ask me, well, why do they put on these huge events every year? And it, and it seems that everybody understands that it's very unlikely there's anything going to come out of it. Well, I think the events is put on by the governments who support the fossil fuel industry as a uh, message to the market under our economic system it's messages to the market that affect the economy with what energy you're going to kind of use how much energy you're going to and the economists call call these messages to the market and so cop 28 would have been a message to the market to keep on burning fossil fuels so that i think is the outcome of cop 28 Certainly, there's absolutely nothing in the COP28 which would suggest that anything is going to be done to even slow down burning of fossil fuels. Now, I think I'm right on that one because I, I caught an article which reported that immediately after the COP28 outcome was published, there was a sharp reduction in the EU carbon exchange, their price on carbon. So there was a market reaction. The next question, of course, is the investment. There was an agreement, I believe, under COP28 to support the tripling of renewable energy investment. If I remember that correctly, that's an excellent result. Obviously, the people who are right and the governments who are right in saying we have to build up renewable energy in order right, <laughs> so that we can let uh, fossil fuel energy disappear. But we have to be reducing fossil fuel energy today because emissions have to be declining according to the IPCC, they had to be declining in 2020. So I guess the one good thing for me about COP28 was that amongst the many recognitions, they had the recognition of that. They had the recognition that the IPCC has said that global emissions had to be in decline 2020. They had it in up to 2025 at the very latest. And they also had in, which of course was the finding of the 2018 1.5C IPCC report, they also had in a substantial reduction in the range of 40 to 45 percent by 2030 for what they're saying is 1.5 degrees C. So uh, those um, confirmations of the IPC science, I didn't see those uh, mentioned in the media at all. They're, they're very, very important because those are the things that we can still hang on to and still hold governments accountable on those because they were in the COP28. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you for adding that. I'm going to now hand it over to Charles, who was also 
at the cop is almost always behind the camera. Although that changed a bit this time. Charles, what do you have to share with us? Thank you, Regina. And thank you, Paul and Dan. Yeah, this, this cop, as all cops, have a certain different personality to them. And uh, some of that uh, difference is dictated by the actual city and venue. And we found Dubai to be a huge city. It's a huge city. It has a wonderful metro. Although Heidi and I were positioned almost at the exact opposite end of town uh, of the venue, which necessitated a one hour, 15, 20 minute ride to cop uh, every day. So that was a little bit different for us. The other thing that was a little bit different about the venue is that previous cops, they were held in fairly large arena type buildings where all the national uh, and NGO pavilions were sort of located on the floor. And you could kind of walk along like you were in a shopping mall, literally, M maybe even more intimate than a shopping mall because the shopping mall, usually there's walls there. But in this case, the pavilions were located in separate isolated buildings. So it was more like walking around on a university campus and you didn't have the ability to uh, be attracted to a particular uh, pavilion by say its cosmetic appearance. You had to be more goal oriented. You had to say to yourself, oh, I think I wanna go to this pavilion because I think it will be interesting without really having seen what they have on display. Uh, so that was different. The other thing that was different is for the first time, I think we had a faith pavilion and we are um, friends with the fellow that helped one of the people that helped to organize that uh, yeah. Rabbi mm -hmm. Yonatan Merrill. And yeah, we spent some time in that faith pavilion and they had their own regular agenda of presentations being given from various faith leaders of the major religions. So it was very interesting. I think Saad Guru was there too. That's correct. And uh, they actually held 70 sessions in the faith pavilion. And from what we saw of it, uh, from what, you know, we actually went to the faith pavilion a few times and what I read about it, it was quite a success. And I know that Yonatan is encouraged that they will have another faith pavilion at the next COP. Yeah, I also want to mention that um, we did get to visit the Canadian pavilion and we did attend a session that Elizabeth May was uh, participating in and we did get to speak with her. So that was one of the highlights of uh, our experience. Also, we did get to work uh, with a few more uh, youth delegates this time around. Um, in particular, a young lady that uh, Dan had had met. It's a long story, but uh, this young lady, Rayanne Mustafa from San Diego, ended up being on one of our panels, the climate education panel. And uh, she had a lot of experience with food waste and, uh, and she's an entrepreneur. And so she was very interesting. And we also met with a few members of the group of a group from Finland, from Helsinki, called Operatio Arctis, which is Operation Arctic. And we had Ani Pokela on one of our panels. So that was very exciting because we forged a working relationship with these people. And we were, we were very grateful to have uh, Dan on a number of programs. And of course, we also worked with uh, the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge. We had Dr. Sean Fitzgerald and Professor Hugh Hunt. So we got to know them a little bit better. So I think uh, all in all, we had a successful experience at COP. Yeah, now another little thing that was maybe a little different about mm -hmm. this COP was the distance mm -hmm. that we had to travel to get there. I mean, mm -hmm. this for Heidi and I, this mm -hmm. involved a 13-hour flight from Toronto mm -hmm. 
to Dubai, which mm -hmm. is the longest flight Heidi and I have ever been on. And I found that it took me quite a while to kind of recover from the jet lag. And I think it was, it presented some health challenges to some of the attendees, say from uh, North, North America, perhaps, or further uh, reaches of the world. So Regina had to, to leave early, which meant that um, we had to get somebody to host the presentations and, uh, and then I filled in on that. So that was a different experience for Heidi and I from that point of view. And so all in all, though, I think the programs that we put together are very good. And uh, definitely uh, the programs we've put out to date, I mm -hmm. think, are, are very good. And we're looking forward to putting out another four programs on top of what we've already released as of this date, as well as three interviews. And I got to meet some interesting people uh, for the these interviews. Some people I already knew, and it was kind of more of an update. I also don't want to forget, I, I want to mention we also had the opportunity to work with John Liu again, and we met his uh, lovely assistant, Old Peron, who ended up doing a program with Regina on the uh, ecosystem restoration communities. Okay, I think that's it for now. Mm -hmm. Regina, back to you. Thank you so much, Charles and Heidi, who I forgot to introduce. Thank you so much for sharing your uh, thoughts and experiences with COP. And I'd look, like to turn it back to Dan. Do you have some more thoughts, Dan, on the substance of the uh, conference? I know that uh, you, Regina, and Paul, and, and Charles and Heidi have been to uh, a number of prior conferences of the parties. I have been too. I think we've all been struck with how present the major fossil fuel companies are. And we often see their greenwashing advertisements. But I was impressed here by the boldness and temerity, perhaps is, is the word, or rank gall that some of them had in attempting to influence the outcome. For example, right smack in the middle, December 6, a critical moment, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries wrote to all of its members and stated the following, Excellency, and, and this is from uh, the, Je the Secretary General writing to each head of the uh, delegation of oil producing uh, nations. I'm writing to you with a sense of utmost urgency. It seems that the undue and disproportionate pressure against fossil fuels uh, may reach a tipping point with irreversible consequences. Now, you know, usually when you're talking about climate change and talking about tipping points with irreversible consequences, as Paul has talked to these audiences uh, repeatedly about, you're not talking about a tipping point with irreversible consequences against the fossil fuel industry, but that's what he's talking about here. As the draft decision still contains options on fossil fuels phase out, while OPEC member countries and non-OPEC countries participating in the Charter of Cooperation are taking climate change seriously and have a proven record on climate actions, it would be unacceptable, this letter states, it would be unacceptable that politically motivated campaigns put our people's prosperity and future at risk. I avail myself of this opportunity to respectfully urge all esteemed OPEC member countries and non-OPEC countries participating in the process and their distinguished delegations to get this proactively reject any text or formula that targets energy that is fossil fuels rather than emissions. So probably we could do a whole show on uh, the section of that letter, but it indicates to me, well, not only a lack of shame, but a, a willingness to flex of, of OPEC, for example, and similar uh, things, I think, uh, were behind the scenes from Exxon and the rest of them to ensure against any final communique that would unduly 
impair their ability to continue business as usual over the next couple of decades. Uh, that is something that struck me strongly and uh, required me every uh, to uh, every evening to try to find some outlet along with Charles and Heidi to to uh, expend the energy and try to regain a sense of sanity in the midst of this particularly bizarre conference of the parties. That is indeed bizarre. It's unbelievable. And it kind of brings the the phrase gaslighting to a strangely humorous, but um, a horrifying place. It is. It's incredible. We're supposed to feel sorry for the poor fossil fuel industry. It makes no sense whatsoever. It's and, and by the way, let me let me also note one other thing. The air quality of Dubai is horrendous. And almost every day that we were there, the air quality was unhealthy, not for for not for highly sensitive groups or not merely for persons who are running outside, but for everyone. Every day I check the air quality monitoring um, that is uh, posted on the internet. It was horrendous. Uh, you you could see it, you could smell it and taste it. Now, the official explanation was that there's a lot of dust from the desert. And that was false. There is some dust from the desert. Uh, and there's also some dust from the sea. I mean, seawater. But most of it, most of that particular matter, the PM 2.5, the most harmful types of uh, particulates that are so small, they can get beyond the alveoli of the at the base of the lungs and into the bloodstream, and and the, and for that reason, then induce cardiovascular events, strokes, and the like. Most of that was from the uh, oil, oil refining uh, within ten miles of that city, and in some places right in the city. Uh, we actually saw a flare, a flare of um, from one of the uh, refineries within sight of the metro that Charles uh, talked about. So anyhow, uh, uh, particularly ironic that uh, not only that there was a cop at this particular city state where the president was the head of the uh, Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, but the air breathed by all the cop attendees was suffused with toxic pollutants caused by the very processes that are inducing harm to the entire planet. Thank you so much, Dan, for speaking to that. And and I have to tell you one thing that I didn't mention since we're talking about Dubai. It's it's really is a giant construction site. It's just where I was staying, there were easily 10 buildings being erected within, like, I didn't even have to move from here to here. It was just building after building after building. And there's there's very little greenery, of course, to purify the air, as it were. So thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts on this uh, particular COP. It really, really means a lot to us. And by the way, every time you like, it really helps us with the algorithm. It helps our videos get out to more and more people. So if you could just go ahead and like this video, it would mean so much. And if you could share, better yet, if you can subscribe, because we are so close to 10,000 subscribers, and we really want to make that landmark. So please, if you've seen one or two of our videos, subscribe. It means a lot to us. We want to have you part of the family. Thank you so much for joining, and we'll see you next time at the Climate Emergency Forum.